No, but I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to uh, be here and to be able to share uh, a portion of God's word and, and maybe some tactics that can help us put our evangelism in action. I, I again appreciate the uh, the support of, of my brothers and, uh, and for all of you uh, for coming out and supporting this conference, but also uh, for wasting an hour and coming up and listening to me. No, but I, I hope that I don't uh, waste the time. I know that, that I definitely won't. Uh, I think we had a mix up with the with the um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, with the slide. You can try again, or you can. We can pull out the table and you can point it towards them. I'm not sure okay. what we're gonna do. Yeah. I wish you could have the, the visual. Uh, again, I apologize that the, the visual is uh, not available. But what we're going to talk about today, can you hear me in the back? Just raise your hand. Great. All right. So, what we're going to talk about today is evangelism in action, in which the objective uh, of our lesson this morning yeah, is going to be to explain evangelism clearly, but also to encourage uh, the creative revision of our strategies. I mean, I think that we we all pretty familiar with what uh, evangelism is and, and, and at least have some kind of idea uh, of how to do it. But I believe as, as times change, uh, what has begun to happen is that a lot of our evangelism has grown stale. Uh, not, not in what we're preaching and what we're teaching, as, as uh, uh, Senior Minister was talking about in the last session, uh, but the gospel is always going to be the major thing and it's always going to teach, it's always going to preach. But what I want to talk about is not changing the contents of our message but rather the delivery, the mindset, uh, and the strategic nature in which we go about uh, making sure that we evangelize. And so what I want to do, uh, again, as we get started, is to, is to properly define evangelism. Evangelism is known as the proclamation or the announcement, the preaching of the good news, the, with the ultimate intention, though, this is what I want to key in on. We all know that evangelism is about teaching and about preaching the good news, but it is with the ultimate intention and the focus of impacting the lives of others with its power and with its benefits as well. Uh, the traditional ways of evangelism that we're pretty much all familiar with is preaching, teaching, singing, personal Bible studies, and even the tracks that we used to have hanging on the wall. I'm not sure how many churches even have the tracks still hanging up, but I've still been in some congregations that still have those, those track racks. Uh, we used to call them as we were growing up. Uh, and later on, we'll even view a few ways that we can add uh, to our to our toolbox, simply we have any love with this stuff. Everything is on this end. Okay, cool. Like I was just saying. Sweet. Thank you so much. Sure. And uh, so whenever we get that up, uh, we'll get that rolling. Appreciate your patience once again. But a working uh, example of evangelism can be found in Acts chapter two and verse number fourteen. As we try to get that rolling, if you just turn with me uh, in your Bibles or your phones or whatever the case may be. Uh, We'll just do this old school, and that's, that's quite all right. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 14 is a, a great example of evangelism here. Acts 2 and 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. And there's five tactics that we can take uh, from this one verse on how to effectively evangelize and how to put our evangelism in action. As many of us know, in this context, in the day of Pentecost, when, when Jesus has ascended and, and the Spirit of God has descended on the apostles and he has filled the room, he's, he's, he's shown up in clothed in tongues of fire, and there's, there's, there's speaking in tongues, and there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of chaos, but one of the first things that happens in their effective evangelism, the first thing that they do is Peter stands up in the midst of perceived chaos. And just like the day of Pentecost, when there was so much going on, so much confusion, so much people that didn't understand, the same can be so in our times today. There's, there's so many different doctrines, so many different ways of teaching, so many different people saying so many different things. Some are right, some are wrong, some have pure motives, some don't. There's chaos and there's confusion, but what effective evangelism calls for us to do is not to become chameleons of con confusion or to allow confusion to continue, but what we've got to do is take a page out of Peter's book and we've got to stand up in the midst of perceived chaos. 
The second thing that he did was he stood up with each other. It said that they stood up together, the entire 11. All of the disciples, they stood up in unity. And when we evangelize as Church of Christ, as yeah. we are doing here at this Connect yeah. Conference, we have to not only be speaking up and be speaking boldly, uh -huh. but we've got to speak in unity. There's got to be an understanding. There's got to be us being on the same page, teaching and preaching the exact same content yeah. of our message. Again, we, we, can, we can differ in the ways that we go about this, but the content of our message needs to be the same. And we also need to make sure that we're doing it in a unified effort. The third thing that we see here from Peter is that he spoke boldly. Again, he, he wasn't quiet. He, he wasn't, you know, nice and timid and, and, and very, very soft about the way that he did things. But when he stood up, he spoke boldly. It says that he raised his voice. Yes, there were a lot of people talking. There was a lot of confusion and things going on. But what Peter does is he speaks above them. In other words, he catches their attention. And he also, number four, speaks directly. He is not indirect. He, he, he has a, a, a aim that he wants to take with them. Uh, that, that he catches their, their attention by speaking directly to the people that need it. And the fifth thing that he did was when he stood up, he had something that was worth listening to. He said it in a way that captivated the audience. Again, I'm going to keep repeating this as, as, as Chris did in the last session. Our attempts in evangelism that we're talking about today is we're not trying to change the content. So when I say when we evangelize, have something to say, when we stand up, I'm not saying that the gospel is not something worth listening to. But what I'm saying is in the way that we present the gospel, in the way that we evangelize, make sure that it captivates the listener's ears and their attention so it is something worth hearing as we evangelize. No, okay, that's, that's, that's quite all right. Um, so the next question becomes, what is this gospel that we teach? The gospel is the good news, the glad tidings. It is a record of historical events. But within the biblical context, and now that is the word by etymology, but within the biblical context, as we know, the gospel is the good news about what God has done to, for us through Jesus Christ. The gospel is a story, a non-fictional story. And the reason I want to stop here at this point of the gospel being a story is because what will begin to happen, uh, as Matt Dabbs explains on his podcast, is, is we begin to become like these, these investigators. If anybody has ever watched uh, uh, some kind of crime investigating, uh, and, and, and Paul, you know about this very well working in the criminal justice system, what begins to happen is these detectives are trying to get a message across. They're trying to get to uh, uh, some kind of result or some kind of answer. And they put up on these boards a bunch of pictures and, and pins and red rope and tape and everything. And it's this whole, like, chaotic mess. But to them, they understand what it means. But to someone else that's looking at it, this is a bunch of nonsense. And I don't understand what's trying, what's, what you're trying to convey here. And I believe that sometimes our evangelism happens this way because we're all over the place. We're so scattered. We're, we're talking about this thing over here and this thing. And we're trying to have this person, that person, that person, this person, and this context of that. And people get lost in our evangelism. And so what we have to do is realize that the gospel is a story. Yes, a non-fictional story, but it is a story that flows with poetic nature, with historical events, in chronological order. Everything happens decently and in order. It's not all over the place. It's a story, and we have to realize that. And this story entails the details of, of, of fascinating events that occur, again, as, as God delivers on his promise of salvation. I would call your attention to Ephesians chapter 1, verses number 7 through 12. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, 7 through 12. Here's what the Bible says. In verse number 7, speaking here about Jesus, it says, In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. We've been able to be bought back. From what sin? From the grips of death. How? By his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Because Jesus Christ was so rich and deep in grace, he gave it to us. He washed us with his blood. He gave us grace. He bought us back from death. He didn't allow us to stay out there. It says, which he made abound toward us in our wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Oh, those of us that know, one back to investigative process. The mystery is simply defined as something that has not been revealed yet. Somebody knows what happens, but the other people who are looking at the mystery don't exactly know what is going on. But he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. It, it pleased God to give us the mystery. It pleased God to let us know what he had kept 
all of this time, in which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one thing Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. It says in verse number 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined toward the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Jesus should be to the praise of his glory. Now that's a mouthful, but what, what is it about? Listen, this gospel is simply about the unfolding manifold wisdom of God being delivered before us, being 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 rolled out right before our very eyes. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of different characters, a lot of different things going on in this story. But the story is unfolding the way that it unfolds because he is trying to show us day by day, story by story, moment by moment, character by character, that he is working everything out together for the good. He's unfolding his wisdom right before our very eyes. And so, so as heralds of the gospel, and when I say the word herald, what I mean is that a herald is someone who relays an official message, but here's the key, without tampering with it, okay? And the reason I want to key in, we don't tamper with it, is because what has begun to happen is we have begun to mold, and I know this is going to be difficult, it's going to be tough, but we've got to face it if we're going to put our evangelism in action properly. What has begun to happen is, as we have begun to, to modify the ways that we evangelize, we also, if we're not careful, begin to, to, to tailor this gospel to ourselves. We begin to add things, we begin to take away things that make us feel good, that we prefer, as if the gospel cannot stand on its own. And so as heralds of the gospel, what we have to do is keep our integrity, and when we give the word, make sure that we're not adding, we're not taking away, because the word can stand on its own. So we are, we are heralds, we are giving an official message without tampering with it. Look at John chapter 1, verses number 6 through 9, the ultimate herald. John chapter 1, verses number 6 through 9. Picking up here in verse number 6, the Bible says, There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for witness, to bear witness of the light, that, through all, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was true, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming in the world. So there's three things that we get from the ultimate herald of John. The first thing that we get from John that we learn as a herald is that we are sent from God. It means that our, our source of information is always needing to be heavenly and never earthly. And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of smart and educated men who stand in pulpits. There's a lot of people who like to give advice, and sometimes the advice is good, sometimes it is bad. First Thessalonians tells us that, that we, we've got to, we, not to scoff at prophecies, but to test every single spirit. My mentor, Chris Jackson, always tells me whenever we're approaching uh, something that is, that, that's foreign information, he says to, 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 to chew the meat and spit out the bone. Okay? Take what's good, get rid of what's bad. But, but we always need to make sure that our information is heavenly. And so we got to realize we're sent from God and we're taking information only from him. But the second thing that we learn from John is that we witness. And this is one of those, those words that we, we get a little uncomfortable with, because when we hear the word witness, our minds typically go to those people that we slam the door in front of on Sunday mornings or Saturday mornings when we're trying to eat our breakfast, right? But, but I'm not talking about just the name of those groups of people. What I'm talking about is an actual witness. As witnesses of God, we stand in the courtrooms of life and state the case for what we know about Jesus. Yeah. That is what a witness is. Yeah. We don't have to be afraid of that word. That's a word that they've taken from us. Right. right? Okay, so we don't have to be afraid of this word witness. We are witnesses. We give our testimony of the things that we talk about. I keep going back to it again. Just in the last session, Chris was talking about telling our story, and he used this, this story of, of, of Legion and how he goes back and he witnesses. He tells the testimony that he had, the experiences, the encounters that he had with Jesus Christ. So what do we tell him? What we know about Jesus, that he is the light of the world. And what is the reason that we do this? Much like John, just like John, so that through us, other people might believe. The third thing that we get from John is that we have to humbly realize that we are not the light. We think that a lot of evangelism is about us. We like to stand in the spotlight. We like to take all the credit. We like to think everything is about us. Everything is about the church. Everything is about us as Christians. We need to realize that we're not the light. We are sent here to be light bearers. What we are here to do is to point towards the light, much like the Bible. 
the Bible it says that there's no power in this physical book. I, I, I can't find any power in this physical book. He says, Jesus says that what the book is for, what the pages, what the leather, what the scrolls were for was to point toward me. And that's what we do. It, it, we are very important. The Bible is very important, but we are not the end goal. What we are here to do is point towards the one who people are to come to. So those are the three things that we've got to keep in mind as heralds of the gospel. When we think of this great story, the gospel, it is that we had a problem. The problem was that sin separated us from God. But the great, the great thing was that God had a fail-safe plan already up his sleeves to reverse the consequence of sin. The gospel is that even though I don't deserve the love of God, his grace treats me so good in spite of my sinful lifestyle. The gospel is that because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, I can now be cleansed of my sins by his blood. I can dodge the bullet of death while enjoying the benefits of a loving relationship with God once again through the Holy Spirit. And so now while we know that this is the gospel that we teach, this is the gospel that we believe and that we preach, when it comes to putting our evangelism in action, I urge us to take a step further. Because the ground level of the gospel is where many of us have gotten started. And, and kudos to us. But what we cannot honor is the lack of growth that many of us have had in our evangelism. It calls for us to continue to abound in grace and grow more and more and more, as Paul says. And so when we think about the evangelism, I want to call your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses number 1 through 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses number 1 through 2. Here's the Bible, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with the excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything uh, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Matt was talking about this yesterday in his class. Uh, and, and that what Paul says, listen, I, I didn't come with, with deep statements. I didn't come with any, any, any theological uh, course. I didn't come with, with, with so much deep information and, and confusing words. I wasn't trying to go over your head. I wasn't trying to take you so deep that you get lost in the concept. He says, when I came to you, I cast everything away. And we know Paul was educated to the teeth. We know that he would he would have been a, a, a Harvard grad, a Vanderbilt grad, and in, in, in what the law taught and, and, and what Jesus had him to do, what God would have him to do. We know he was well educated, but he says, "Listen, when it came to when it came to me first coming to you, I took all my degrees off the wall, I threw all the deep words, I threw all of my education to the side." He says, he basically says, "I became stupid for you. I became elementary for you." And I think this is this is this is good here. Okay, I, I'm not I'm not downing you. Us being on the ground level. There are times we have to be at ground zero in our evangelism to get started or to get our foot in the proverbial door of men's hearts. To get started. But there also comes a time that we need to elevate our evangelistic approach. And so what I want to talk about for just a few minutes here is how we can, how we can elevate that evangelistic approach. And if you would, just, just take your contextual Church of Christ thinking caps off for a moment and let me paint you a picture, okay? Can we do that? Okay? Follow me to verse number six, and I want you to see something here. He says, despite what I did, I become stupid for you. In verse number six, he says, however, in other words, there, there's another part of this. We speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. He says, yes, I cast off all of my education for you for a moment. But he says there's also some deep theological statements and some evangelism that has to happen. It's just got to be with people who are mature. And so the reason that we're elevating ourselves into this different evangelistic approach, bless you, is because I believe everyone in here is mature. Okay? And so, so if you allow me to just lean on you and, and, and assume that we're all being mature here, in verse number seven he says, but we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery. That, that's where we get sometimes. We just learned about the mystery. Right? What is a mystery? A mystery is something that I'm, I'm hearing you talk about, but I don't really understand. And I believe in a lot of cases, our evangelism has gotten to that point where the world is like, okay, I know what you're trying to convey, but I don't get it. This is a mystery to me. I'm confused. I'm lost. Sometimes we evangelize the mystery. He says the hidden wisdom. Sometimes we hide the wisdom of God because we don't know how to effectively evangelize. Which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 
Not even use your, your Church of Christ mindset for just a second. What this is about, I understand in, in context, what Paul is talking about is, is going back to Ephesians chapter 1. It's the manifold wisdom of God that piece by piece was being held in, 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 uh, in a microcosm and revealed little by little to be understood. Because if I give you everything at once, you'll mess this thing up. The reason he gave us a mystery, he says in verse number 8, he says, because if, 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 I, if I laid all of my cards on the table, you wouldn't have killed him and you would have messed up your evangelism. You would have messed up your salvation. But, but for our context of evangelism, there are times where there is information that needs to be given that cannot be understood because we're not effectively doing so. And this is what happens in verse number 9. He says, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor have heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What happens is if we don't elevate our evangelistic approach and we continue to evangelize in a mystery that people cannot understand, I will not see, it will not hear, and it will not enter into the hearts of men what God has in plan for those he loves. That's why we have to elevate. That's why we have to change. That's why we have to grow in our evangelism. Let me give you just a piece here uh, from, from, from my personal uh, information. This, this, is, this is free here. One of the things, listen, I grew up, my father's a gospel preacher. I grew up in the church all of my life. But I had reached a point at, at, at the previous congregation that I was at in the, in the situation that I was in where I topped out. I had learned everything that I needed to learn. I prayed to God, listen, elevate me, give me mentors that can lead me to the next level. And you know something? God responded. He gave me mentors like Brother Christopher Jackson, my senior minister, and mentors like Matt Miller, who have poured into me and have elevated me to a new approach. And that is what I'm trying to do with us now. It's because until we elevate our approach, we're going to top that. I believe that, that where we are right now, we've gotten very comfortable. We begin to look back in the past and try to grab what once was. But we got to move forward to newer heights and begin to blaze past uh, for ourselves, okay? So that, that's what we're talking about now. Now, turn with me to John chapter 10. Let me switch over here. John chapter 10, verses number 1 through 7. And for time's sake, we'll, we'll just we'll paraphrase. In John chapter 10, verses number 1 through 7, what Jesus begins to do is he begins to give a parable, a story to his disciples about a gate and a door. And, and, and what he's trying to do is explain evangelism in a way that they can understand that this gate uh, is his kingdom and Jesus Christ is the door that leads into the kingdom, that leads into his church. And so he's explaining this to them in the first seven verses. And this is what I call the ground level of the gospel. We've done an amazing job at teaching the door and how to enter into the door. And even still, we can improve on our approach in that. And we'll look at that briefly when we get to a close. But what I believe is lacking in the preaching and the evangelism and the teaching in the Bible studies that we do on evangelism is what exactly lies behind the door. I believe that is the mystery that has been left out of the gospel. Okay? Uh, there's a preacher who gives a, a uh, example of if I buy a shoe store and I want to get the word out about my shoe store. I put it right downtown and, and, and I buy all these great shoes. I hire all these great people. I've got a great store. And I say, you know what? I got to get the word out. I got to evangelize about my store. And as I began to evangelize, as I began to get out the, the, the information, I realized I kind of get a commercial. And so I called out to the radio stations and the TVs, and I get me a commercial, and they air it on TV. But this is how the commercial goes. Listen, I, I've got to be a new store. Great shoes in there. This door that I've got in front. It's great. It, it's, it's overlaid with, with, with wood, some of the greatest wood, the cherry, the oak. It, it's got the gold. It's got the silver. It's got beautiful window panes. It's got stained glass windows. It, it's got a crystal doorknob and, 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 and great furnishings on the outside. The door frame is great. I mean, there's windows, there's bricks, and all, all the parking lot is great. And I start talking about all this stuff, and I say, I'll come down to my store. Who's going to come? Nobody. Why? Because if I want to see the outside of your building, I'll just ride by and keep on going. If I wanted to get the word out about my store, what would I do? Tell them what's behind the door. Yes, sir. I would tell them about the great nature of my shoes. I would tell them about the, the great music that we play and the great atmosphere. And I would tell them about the great employees that we have and the great sales. And, and how I've got great boots and I've got great dress shoes. I've got great sneakers. I've got everything that you need behind my door. What if we tell people what's in the store, they don't need to know about the door. They will beat the door down to get to what's inside. Yeah. And this is what happens in verse number 10. That we, This is the evangelistic approach that we have to get. 
In verse number 10, he, Jesus said, the thief does not come to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundant. Yeah. What we've got to do is tell people about the abundant life that they can have in Jesus' kingdom. We've got to shift, and listen to me here, don't, don't lose me. We've got to shift from telling people about rules and regulations of doctrine on the front end yeah. and leaving Jesus out. Listen, there's enough rules and regulations in my home, yeah. on my job, at my school, in the world, in, in the company that I work for, in the government that we live in. There's enough rules and regulations. I don't need any more. Rules and regulations and doctrine is important, but we cannot lead our evangelism with that. Yeah. If we lead our evangelism with that, people are saying, I don't want any more rules. What people need to hear is about how my life is going to be changed. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If I walk through that door, people need to know what's the why. Listen, a, a what without a why is the, the, the definition of empty evangelism. What in the world am I coming for? I heard about this great door that you were talking about, but what? If I walk through it, how's it going to affect my life? What's going to change? Because I walk through this door. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to tell people what lies behind the door. What is the abundant nature of the life that people can have with Jesus Christ? If you look, uh, we're going to run out of time. We'll, we'll, we'll skip down uh, to some of the more important ways that we can make these shifts. So we've got to understand what the Great Commission is from an evangelist perspective and from a church perspective. If you would, turn to the, to the uh, mission statement of the church, Matthew chapter 28, verses number 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses number 18 through 20. Here's what the Bible says. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded to you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's a couple of things that we try to take from this. First and foremost, from an evangelist perspective, we are all evangelists. That may not be something that you put on your desk, on your, on your name tag. It may not be something you get paid for at your local congregation, but each and every one of us is an evangelist. All we do as evangelists is get the word out. Maybe not proper. But every single person is an evangelist. Every single person can get the word out. But from this evangelist perspective, individually, what we've got to do is go. I mean, it's as simple as that. We've all heard or at least uh, at least heard or read the book, Go Ye Means Go Me, right? We know that one. First and foremost, if we haven't left the sidelines, there's the biggest issue. We've, we've got to get in the game. We've got to get on the field. There, there, there's plenty of reasons and issues that, that keep us from being active in evangelism. And obviously, I can't touch them all. But I do want to touch on two um, as we begin to draw to a close. The first one is, listen, as we think about going, the pandemic shook a lot of people up. It shook a lot of things up. It changed a lot. And even still, it is still changing things. And I, I understand that we've got to be safe. I understand that, that we've got to, you know, maintain within safety protocols. But what I believe I'm beginning to see is that many people have gotten lax in what we call the itis. What the itis is, is, is remember, it's, it's that post-lunch struggle, right? When, when you, you, you're on your job and you're at school and you go to lunch and you eat a little too much and, you, and you're struggling going back to work. You're struggling getting back and finishing that day at school, right? Many of us are struggling with the itis. Preachers and, and even people that have, that have just sat in a, uh, a gospel meeting or whatever the case may be, you have that morning service, you go downstairs and eat, you try to come back up again, and you got to fight against that chicken, grease, and macaroni, right? It's tough when you start falling asleep, but that's what the itis is called. And I believe, I think the shutdown has, has, has pushed a lot of us to, to catch the ice, right? Uh, I think a lot of churches are still taking it easy. Well, there's a lot of work to do. A lot of churches, here, here's where I, I think a lot of our churches are, are finding themselves if they're not careful. I believe what has begun to happen is churches are beginning to mask safety with laziness. Okay. Understand there's safety protocols, there's things we've got to stay within, there's guidelines and things like that. But as we abide with safety protocols, let's make sure that we stay diligent. Yeah, man. Okay? Because it, it's very easy yeah. to fall into that. Okay? Yeah. So let, let me show you. Let me show you why. And just in case you still have an excuse, go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Pick it up in verse number 1. Here's the key. Acts chapter 1, as you know, in chapter 7, Stephen a, a, uh, becomes a martyr. He's a church leader. 
uh, as Hiram was even talking about yesterday, he, he's one of those ones who, who's a pioneer in the faith, but he finds himself standing up for the gospel. He finds himself on death's door, and in verse number 8, Saul was consenting to his death. But at that time, bless you, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now, this sounds a lot like what the pandemic did to America. Yeah. To the world, period. It's driving people home. It's killing people. It's coming from house to house. It's, it's finding people on your job. It's sending you home. Everybody is running scared. Right? People are dying. There's havoc. There's chaos. There's craziness going on all over the world. It's shutting down. But after running through their lives, watch what happens in verse number four. Therefore, in other words, because of this havoc, Come on, Bobby. because of it, Amen. those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. As they're running scared, they're running for their lives, they're going home, they're trying to stay alive, they're running and they're preaching. They're running, but evangelism is still in action. What's our excuse? Pandemic's very real. There's no excuse for our evangelism to not be in action. The second reason, and I think it's most relevant uh, for everyone that's sitting in this room, I think we fail to go because we begin to feel that we're not good enough. We begin to feel that we're, we're inadequate. I, I can't evangelize this generation. I can't talk to those kind of people. Interchange it. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't get with that. But in, in, in Exodus chapter 3, in verse number 11 through 14, there's a quote that goes, you don't have to be great to get started, but you got to get started to be great. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God begins to show this to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, a very familiar passage. Exodus chapter 3, verses number 11 uh, through 14, the Bible says, But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Or that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He's still in that. So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent you. And they say to me, What's his name? What should I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am blind. And he says, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Well, we can take from this passage in Exodus chapter 3 that, that Moses is telling you that. God is telling Moses, excuse me, number one is that you have to realize that God is with you as you advance. And if God be with you, you will be against you. The second thing we've got to realize in this text is that we've got to realize the power of the one who is sending us out to advance. Mm -hmm. God says, I am that I am. It is a phrase that I was going to have it up on the screen. It is a unique phrase that describes God. It is a phrase that is one of the few ones that, that and it may be the only one, I can't think of another one, that is in, in when talking about God, is in the past, present, and future tense. What I am that I am means is that I am the living and existing God. What I am that I am means is that at this present moment, I am exactly what I need to be based upon the situation that's going on. I am that what I am exactly for you based upon the situation that you find yourself in. In the past, when you came up on situations, when you find yourself in difficult situations, I became whatever I needed to be to make sure that you got the job done. In the future, when you run up on things you don't know how to handle, he says, I will transform into whatever I need to be to make sure that you can put your evangelism in action. We have no excuse for not going. And so he says, make disciples, though, back, back in our mission statement in Matthew 28. He says, make disciples of all nations. To make means to put together. Right? This, is, this, is, this is our project. To put together, to take people where they are and use the available parts of them to make a disciple for Jesus. You've got to be the driving force for someone changing their lives for Jesus. What are we making? We're making disciples. A disciple is one who is ever learning about Christ and his kingdom. It is people who have a desire and a will to follow after Jesus, the master teacher. Our job is not to judge people on what they don't know. It's not to talk about people and what they believe and why we don't think it's right. Our job is to teach people Jesus so they can transform their lives. Taking a step further, our evangelism in many instances, as I was hearing was talk about this morning even, is that a lot of our evangelism is geared towards getting people in our church building. There's no issue with that as long as it's not the end goal of our evangelism. My fear, though, is that it is in most cases. Because high numbers drive 
our ego. They, they, they feed our ego, right? And the end goal of evangelism is not supposed to be to physically get people in church buildings. It's supposed to be getting Jesus in people so they can leave the walls of the church and impact the world by the way. Yeah, amen. That's the ultimate goal of evangelism. Yes, we got to get them physically there to do so, but that's not the end goal. Okay? Who says, do, you do this, though, by making disciples of all nations and also by baptizing them in the name. Yes, physically, we've got to be baptizing people. We all know that. But also in our joint efforts. And this is where the church perspective of the Great Commission comes into existence. The idea here is the words, the phrase, the Great Commission, meaning that a group of people have been instructed, commanded to work together with all of our differences, our uniqueness, and the plethora of talents to achieve one purpose. We should be working together without any resistance, without any fighting, without any difficulty, working together to not build billions of different ministries working for relevancy and impact, but that we should be working together to build a community of evangelism together. He says, though, that your, your evangelism should be so concentrated, your evangelistic action should be so concentrated that the world is literally baptized in the name of God. It's that you're working so much together that, 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 that I'm so connected to you. We're so closely working and related together that people are drowning in the presence of God after this weekend. That's how concentrated and close we're supposed to be working together. He says that when we work together, we become unstoppable. So we cannot be separated. We've got to work together. If we move to a close here, I'm going to give us two final shifts uh, that we can make to bring in more fish. Jesus calls us fishers of men. If you meet me in John chapter 21 and verse number 6. John chapter 21 and verse number 6. Peter is speaking to the disciples here. And he says, listen, I'm going to get ready uh, to go out and fish. And all the disciples say, you know what, we're, we're going along with you. And they fished all night and they catch nothing. But in the morning, Jesus finds himself on the shore. He says, no, he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. I want to tell you, based upon this verse, what we find is that a simple change can bring in an enormous amount of fish. We find them making one small shift. They were fishing on the left. He says, just move to the right. Just turn around. Just make a small shift. And on the left, they caught nothing, but with a small shift, their nets were breaking. They couldn't even bring it in. I believe that, that if we make these small shifts, along with some of the other small shifts that we can find in other books about evangelism, I believe that our nets will begin to break. What do I mean about nets beginning to break? Matt, you know this one very well. We'll get to a place to where we're having so many fish come into the net that they're breaking. Our church buildings will have to be reconstructed. Why? Because we've got so many people coming in that we've got to rebuild. That's a good problem. That's a good issue to have. And I believe that we just got to make some small shifts as we begin to close. One of the first uh, small shifts that we've got to make is that we've got to surrender more to the work of the Holy Spirit in our evangelism. Okay? This is where we begin to fall off and we begin to lose our power because we like to do everything on our own. We don't like to be told what to do because we like to do things exactly how we want to do them. We plan and we get strategic uh, plans and things together and we're meeting with so many different people and we're leaving the most powerful presence on earth out of our meetings, which is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's, who's called our paraclete. He's supposed to come alongside us and help us. He's built, he's fashioned, he's created specifically to work hand in hand with us. We're never supposed to have to evangelize on our own. John chapter 14, verse number 26, again, calls them the paraclete. And, and, and what John 14, 26 says, that he will call things to remembrance, those things which Jesus taught, and he will give them back to us. But also in John chapter 16, verses number 7 through 9, I won't read it for time's sake, but it says that, that the Spirit will come to convict the world. He will teach the world about the sins, the things that they have done wrong, and he will convict them. So listen. In John chapter 14, the, the Spirit is teaching us the things of Jesus, but in John chapter 16, he's teaching other people about the things that we're teaching and how it affects their lives. So he's teaching us, and he's teaching them. He's working on both sides. So how can we expect to evangelize without the Holy Spirit? Well, well, can't do it. Evangelism can be as simple as just rubbing somebody with love. God will put people on a simple platter first. 
He will lead people into our lives at, at, at some of the most crazy times of their life, some of the most strange and difficult times of their lives. And it's not by accident. It's not by coincidence. But it's by divine intervention yeah. that God is working through people and our situations to bring people together to, so we can see them in their difficult times of life. And the Spirit can bring to the remembrance the things in which we've studied to impact their lives to bring them closer to God. Yeah. That's what it's all about. And, and the Spirit and God will put things on a silver platter for us. But we're, if we're out of tune with the Holy Spirit, we'll miss it. God will give us opportunities. The Spirit will teach us how to use them. What we've got to do is listen to the Holy Spirit when he works. Yeah. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 19 says that we cannot quench the work of the Holy Spirit. So we've got to cooperate with him. If you remember that Philip in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 26, because he followed the Spirit to evangelism, a soul was saved. We've got to do the same thing. We've got to follow the Spirit because he will lead us to evangelize. The last shift that we've got to make as we bring this thing to a close is that we've got to be able to build authentic relationships. Yeah. All of us have been on a car lot before and, and, and begin to, to try to uh, buy a car and meet with, with the salesman. And, and at, it doesn't take very long for you to see that this salesman doesn't care about me, doesn't care about anything I have going on, and he definitely doesn't care about my bank account. <laughs> doesn't take long to figure that out, right? It's all about the conversion. It's all about the commission. It's all about getting this sale so I can put some money in my pocket. And I believe when, in our evangelism, if we're not authentic about our relationships, people can pick up on that as well. They can think, you, you don't really care about me. You, you're just trying to trick me, trying to dupe me, trying to get me enough information so that people can look at you and say, man, your conversion commission is high. You get a lot of people in here. People can pick up on that. People need to know that we're authentic about their well-being. They don't even know the deepest theological statements. They don't even know how to quote every verse in the Bible. They don't need to know who, who, who wrote every book and, and all of this background. What they do need to know is that when you teach me, you're going to be there for me, and you're going to be with me in my highs and my lows as I walk with Christ. Not someone who's going to dip me in the water and then dip on me and never be seen again. I need to know you're going to be there for me. You can't fake that. You, you can't make these fake relationships. People will pick up on that, and they will find you out. And when people see that you're not real, you're not authentic, it begins to percolate throughout the whole body. They really don't care. Because one person didn't care. So we've got to really care about people. Um, and, and we've got to realize, again, that just because people don't respond the way we want them to on the spot doesn't mean my evangelism was not effective. Just because I talked to you today and you didn't get baptized, it doesn't mean my evangelism wasn't effective. Just because I, I preached a great message, I taught a great message, and, and, and not one non-believer came forward doesn't mean my evangelism wasn't important, right, Matt? Forty years he spent with somebody. But just last week he came to faith. Listen, it's about watering. Yeah. Planting evangelistic seeds, watering and letting God give the increase. We need to create these authentic relationships where people can know. <clears throat> That even if I'm not saved, I can still impact you with my life. I can still laugh. I can still joke. I can still go out to dinner with you. I can still pray for you. I can still affect you with my life and my Christianity without you being in the, in the world. Without you being in my physical building, I can still evangelize with you with just a relationship. We've got to get to that place where it's, it's we're not pushing. Hey, you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Hey, come on. You just need to know but you're going to be there for me, and eventually we'll begin to chip away at it. And we'll get them to the place where we need them to be. Listen, people don't have to be physically with us all the time, but we can again affect them with our relationships by building authentic ones, by following the Holy Spirit, making some slight shifts, and bringing in more fish. The most important thing about evangelism is impacting without imposing. I can impact you without forcing you to do what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I've said something that, that, that can put your evangelism in action. Uh, again, I apologize for the slides not being up, but I think the Spirit still got the lesson across. Uh, so all glory and honor to God. Uh, and I pray again. Uh, let's see. Does everybody got a, a second for a quick prayer? Let, let's go to God and pray. Most gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity at the Connect Conference to connect with one another, to learn and to refresh our minds, our souls. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will prepare our hearts, prepare our minds to put our evangelism in action. Put us in the right state of minds. Give us opportunity to allow us to spring our evangelism into action, that we may bring lost souls to you, that we may follow the Holy Spirit, and that we may build authentic relationships. I pray that you bless every single one of us as we leave this place, that we don't depart from your love, your grace, your teachings, or your mercy, Father. Bless us all. Bless this conference. This prayer we ask in Jesus' name.